Hey everyone, welcome back to Data Driven Health Radio. Today I have the wonderful privilege of introducing Carrie Brown onto the show and we're gonna talk about something that is very relevant in today's society, in the current headlines, and someone who has a very powerful message around mental illness. Specifically, we're gonna talk about becoming your own detective, and we're gonna talk about how to biohack mental illness. And Carrie Brown is with me today. She's gonna to share from her own personal experience. I've known Carrie for quite some time. I've seen her speak many times. Her message is powerful and genuine and authentic. She's knowledgeable. She speaks from personal experience. And I really hope today's episode can reach people who are looking for answers. So, Carrie, thank you for joining us here today. It's a great honor to have you on Data Driven Health Radio. Thank you, Dave. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I I really really appreciate the time that you're giving so that I can share what I've learned and maybe help some other people who are struggling with issues similar to what I was. So um, we're social media buddies. We uh, we nerd out all the time online. And we roll in a lot of the same circles through the good team over at Keto Evangelist. So we've been crossing paths for a long time. But I think this year at KetoCon, we actually had a chance to meet face to face for the first time. And she I don't know if we shaked hands or we hugged. Do you remember? Oh, I have pictures. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> we there was definitely hugging, but cool. um I so this is probably my bad that we haven't actually physically crossed paths sooner because yeah. I'm I'm a bit of a hermit and yeah. I'm, I'm a raving introvert. Yeah. So last year at KetoCon, I kind of, I did my talk and then ran away and hid. And uh, this year I was like, I can't do that. If I want yeah. to, if I really want to share this message, if I really want to help people, then I've got to get out there and be visible and, and talk to people. And here we are. Well, you brought the house down last year. That was one of the most powerful presentations I've ever seen in my life. It was so totally awesome. I, I, I admit that my, my number one goal when I was preparing for that talk, and I, I actually sat for a week, and that's how long it took me to wrote it. I, I sat on the couch for a week writing it. And my, my number one goal was to make sure that everybody who heard it cried. And that may sound a bit weird, but we need people to take action. And people don't take action unless they feel something. Yeah. So I had to invoke emotion mm -hmm. because we need people to act. The, the mental health crisis that we're currently experiencing, we've got to, to change it if we have any tools that could change it. 
And so that was why um, I made it so emotive. It was an emotional kick in the ass. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a literal uh, kick in the ass, but a metaphorical kick in the ass by really hitting home for a lot of people. So it was incredible. So let's just, let's just dive in because there's a lot of stuff we want to talk about here. And, and just to reiterate, the, the theme that, that Carrie and I want to really hit home here is, is how to become your own detective when it comes to mental illness. So Carrie, let's just start off by telling us where you came from and let's start there and define that. And then you can just segue with that first discovery you made. That, that offered that first glimmer of hope around the DNA stuff. But we're talking, we're talking about mental illness and bipolar. So help us set the stage for that. And then let's just go into how we can help people become their own detective. So it's a, it's a long story. It's a lifelong story. But I'm, I'm going to make the, the first bit really, really short because I want to focus on what you can do if yes. you or someone you love is is in a situation similar to mine that you want to get out of i want to focus on what you can do rather than focusing on you know uh, how it life before um i became my own detective so the 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 elevator pitch if you like is that i was born depressed i was depressed my whole life i tried everything that conventional medicine told me to do I ran the gamma on various antidepressants and so on and so forth eventually gave up um was in massive psychological and emotional pain from this this constant depression that there seemed to be no understanding of or resolution of from anything i tried and it came to a head five years ago uh, in 2013 when I actually had a mental break and I ended up, my therapist actually called the police and told them I was suicidal, which I didn't appreciate at the time, but I later, <laughs> later I appreciated so. it very yes. much. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time I was really annoyed about that Yeah, um, because I didn't want to be alive so yeah. when they send someone around to rescue you it's just like really really can you just not leave me alone you had to screw um, that up for me didn't right you? yeah um but joking aside so i had a mental break the therapist called the police i there ended up there was a whole debacle six cops paramedics handcuffs i ended up handcuffed to a, a bed in the hospital under armed guard because i had become suicidal and I somehow, and I was on the verge of being committed um, because the laws in Washington state allow, uh, allow certain members of the medical community to commit you under certain situations, mm -hmm. certain uh, circumstances. I managed to talk myself out of being committed. Um, the result of that was that I had to agree to a psychiatric evaluation and diagnosis, and then I had to continue psychiatric treatment. So I started this merry-go-round of psychiatric uh, evaluations, and I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. Mm -hmm. And there followed this merry-go-round of psychiatrists and therapists and doctors and medications while they tried to figure out something that would keep me stable enough to not kill myself. And so, so just to jump in there, Carrie, before this, I mean, you, we talked about this before the show started. You, you were working at Microsoft, a mm -hmm. highly prestigious technology company. Obviously, prior, prior to that, you, you were really... I, I would say in the corporate world, executing for a, for a high profile company. So at what point did, did that start to change? So it, it, the, the depression had been lifelong. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I learned at quite a young age to fake it. Got it. Because I had to, that was the only way I could survive. Um, and I, I learned very quickly that that by being who I was, by allowing the depression to be obvious to other people did not help me. 
because the, the, then the negative feedback from other people just made everything a million times worse. So I learned to, and, and I had a run in with alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in my early twenties, I had a run in with alcohol uh, and that helped, you know, a bit in the moment, but sure. overall, of course, that, that doesn't help at all, but it's good pain avoidance in the, in the short term. Yep. Um, but I just got to the point where nobody seemed to be able to help me and I tried everything I knew. And so in order to get through life, you, you just, I just faked it. You know, I was like a performing seal at SeaWorld. I just, you know, you come out and, and you behave in a way that is socially acceptable and you hide the emotional trauma that's going on in your head on a daily basis with the yeah. depression because yeah. that's what you have to do to you know earn money and and make the whole thing work so i've been in a similar situation carrie where i i was in the tech world and and going through some really really extreme stress and anxiety and obviously on a nowhere near the scale but but there were times where i had to go in and show up and and i was responsible for a team of people at a silicon valley company that's just exploding and i was a wreck inside mm -hmm. so i can completely relate to that for sure and and that's a large part of why i started down my path to do what i'm doing and presumably ultimately a part of your journey as well so on some level, I can relate to that, certainly. Yeah, it was, you know, it just became, it, it became the only way I could make it through. And I'm, and I'm single, and I've been single for a long time. So, you know, if I didn't go out and make the money to pay the mortgage, I, everything was going to go to hell in a handbasket. Sure. So, yeah. you know, I, I just, there's that. But what people saw, nobody at, at Microsoft had any idea that, that, I was suicidal and depressed and, you know, all of those things because that's very career limiting. <laughs> you know, uh, you, yeah. you show really? up with that, right? And, yeah. you know, and I couldn't, uh, you know, so I just had to weigh the kind of this tightrope to totally. like manage it yeah. as best I could show up, not get fired. Not kill myself, and you know, just those are the first two priorities of the day. Don't kill myself. Don't get fired, and <laughs> and, and, and right. maintain appearances while we're in the office. Right. Uh, actually, but, that's, that's probably a lot more common than we realize. You know, when you really think about how many people are 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 dealing with with issues in in big companies and things of that nature. But but it's exhausting, and and you know, you know, from what you've just shared about the stress levels, it's exhausting. And and if you can, you know, imagine if you add to that, like there's a voice in your head constantly when you're awake telling you to kill yourself. And you're in front of, you know, all these people at work and yeah. trying to perform and, you know, trying to be this like little ray of sunshine because that's what they need you to do. Yep. And, and it's it absolutely exhausting absolutely. to keep up that charade, if you will, of, of trying to be what everyone else needs you to be when there's this part of your brain is just like telling you to die. It's just, it's exhausting. Yes, I remember sitting in meetings and actually experiencing panic attack and I'm still smiling. Like, oh, hey, hey. talking through like nothing's wrong. And, and you just, you had that, I had an anxiety attack. You know, I, I, yeah, it was incredible. So that you maintain appearances through all of that stuff. So anyhow, I, I, I wanted to talk I wanted to jump back a bit because we both have these experiences in big tech company, but maybe we can jump back to where you were before, which is right where you had convinced these doctors not to c commit not you. Not to commit me. Yeah. That, that would have been, that would have been everything limiting for me. You're a shrewd was, negotiator there, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was Oscar worthy performance. Oh, I, have I to bet tell it was. You. Yeah. I, um, I, I was very, very lucky yeah. that this all went down in the middle of the night and yeah. there was there was one person in king county up in washington that is responsible for signing off on on anyone who's going to be committed and because it was the middle of the night it took her five hours to get to the hospital and so that five hours was the five hours where I, there was enough of my 
intellect was still like ticking that I managed to tap into that. Cause I'm like, if you do not get yourself out of here, yep. your life is literally, you'll be alive, but you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your house. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose, you know, so being committed was just not a thing for me. That's incredible. You're like, I have this window of time where you're like, I, I have to pull my shit together here right now yep. and get myself out of this situation or I'm yep. going to lose everything. Yep. And, and it would literally, and if that sounds dramatic, it was that dramatic. And, yeah. you know, because I'm like, nobody even knew I was in the hospital. Yeah. No, I didn't. I, myself, I didn't have my cell phone with me. I yeah. had no contact numbers. There was nobody I could call because yeah. who knows numbers if they don't have their cell phone with them. Yep. And, you know, my cell phone's at home because the police didn't stop to pick that up for me when, I, when they dragged me out. Oh, so yeah. It was, oh, you know, I'm in hospital. Nobody knows I'm there. It, it would have been disastrous had I been committed. So I got myself out of that. I was diagnosed with bipolar two. Um, they got me on medication that kept me just stable enough to, to um, stop wanting to kill myself. And so that went on for about nine months and I was able to, you know, drag myself back through the days. Uh, but nine months after that, I became suicidal again. And I actually had to take a medical leave because I literally couldn't function. And after six, five, five or six months of, of this suicidal ideation for, for five months straight, like every, if I was awake, there was a voice in my head telling me, to kill myself. Yeah. Um, and after five months, I just, I just called bullshit. I'm just like, I no, I'm seeing a psychiatrist every week for half an hour. I'm paying him $300 every week for half an hour. And it got to the point where I was going into his office and I, and, and I'm a deep thinker. I think a lot. And so I go in there and I'm like, hey, I've been thinking about this. What do you think about that? And he'd go, hey, that's a great idea. Let's try that. And then I'd go in the next week and I'd say, hey, I heard this or that or whatever else it was. What do you think about that? And he'd go, that's a great idea. Let's try that. And I'm going, wait, what? Like uh, all the, I'm paying you $300 to validate that I'm having good ideas about what might be wrong with me. Like, yep. Like, no, stop it. So, and, and I just became very angry because there was no critical thinking going on by anybody except me. Yeah. Who was asking, why does she have, why did she suddenly go from being depressed to having bipolar? Like it's something Nobody caused asked it. What was questions. it? Nobody was asking those questions. Nobody. Nobody, they just wanted to medicate me to the point where I was socially acceptable and not wanting to kill myself. Whereas I'm sitting there going, but if we figure out why I'm bipolar, surely then we'd have a chance to stop me being bipolar. And maybe that was naive, but in my eyes, that was like, isn't this logical? Like, why are we not trying to find out why? And so I fired everybody. Literally everybody, my entire medical, t other than my psychotherapist who I've been seeing for 12 years and he's absolutely wonderful and I love him. But talk therapy, talk therapy will only help with, if you are clinically depressed or have something like bipolar, you can't talk your way out of that. You can't talk your way out of depression any more than you can talk yourself out of a broken leg or diabetes. Sure. So talk therapy is great to a point mm -hmm. because it made me feel validated as a human. And in it, you know, it, it was good to have 90 minutes a week, which were all about me because the rest of my life was nothing about me. So, so I didn't fire him, but I fired everybody else. And I, I had been thinking, you know, all through these months, like, why am I bipolar? What is it? And so I was like, okay, is it genetic? Is it environmental? Is it, is it food allergy related? Is it chemical related? Is it just my father was manic depressive? Is like, what is it? 
So I decided to start my, my detective work with DNA because DNA is, it is what it is. It's, it's absolute. Your DNA 100%. is your DNA. Whereas when you're looking at, you know, is it a food intolerance? There's so many variables in there. Is it a chemical intolerance? So many variables. It, so I thought it's quantifiable and right. it's affordable now. So we can do this as, as empowered consumers, which is wonderful. Right. So I thought, why don't I just knock off the, 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 the least variables? Let's start at the things that are least variable and knock those off. So I, I sent off for my DNA 23 and, and me is the right. just just to uh, throw yep. that out there, which I'm sure everyone has heard of at this time. There's there's other services out there, but that's so the one I've done. That's the one you've done. So yep. cool. Go ahead. So and it, and it's super easy. You you order it online. They send you a kit. You spit in a tube, which actually was harder than it sounds. There was a lot of spit involved, but yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> you know, I've done the adrenal saliva cortisols. You have to fill four tubes. Right. So, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, I got my DNA back and and then you have to, unless you're you're into epigenetics, into which case you don't need to do this anyway, um, you, you actually have to so upload that data into those various online tools that you can use, which will spit you out a much more consumer friendly, um, yeah. understandable version of your DNA. So let's and, let's unpack that for a second, Carrie, because with 23andMe, you get all this. They'll give you some traits in their right. website, like you have 0.5% uh, Neanderthal, and you metabolize coffee pretty well, and 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 things of that nature. But but Are you the only rod, 0.5%. I'm like 2.9% Neanderthal. I can't remember. I got to go check. <laughs> I, I'm going to check that and we'll have a little Neanderthal competition here. I'm going to see if I have a coming in higher than that. And, and I'm 0.6% Spanish. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's amazing what they pick up. You know, there's Native American way down my lineage somewhere and it picked it up, which is, which is remarkable. But more importantly is all this raw data that is completely meaningless, all these genetic right. snips and stuff that's intense. So the raw data is there. And then what you can do is, again, this is just for people who are listening who haven't done this. There are services out there that will just instantly connect to your 23andMe raw data. They'll just say, hey, Carrie, we need your permission to access your 23andMe raw data. Genetic Genie is the one I'm most familiar with, but I'd love to know what you used. And then it will run some more like uh, human-friendly analyses on, yep. on raw data. And it'll tell you these, these, these mutations. So anyhow, just to unpack that for people who are listening, that's, that's what I've done. It sounds like that's what you did. What service did you use? Do you remember? So I think the one, there's one on, I think it's mthfr.net, but I could be wrong. I'll find out and I'll send yeah. it that you can that's put in cool. the show notes. Yeah, that'd be cool. There's one called Prometheus. Yeah. But now there's Dr. Ben Lynch, who is the master of methylation. Uh, he's up in Seattle he has a new tool and it's called, again, I'll send you the link, but I think it's called Strat Gene. Mm -hmm. And it's, I want to say it's $45. Now this has come out since I did it. it. And so I haven't done this, but I have some friends who talk to me. Um, some of our coaches on the Keith Evangelist team talk to me about this and they have run their data through his tool and it is very specific. It, it, it's very user friendly and it comes out with a lot of really, really specific. Okay. These are the problems on, on the snips that are super relevant. So that, but I think that costs $45. Um, so that, and as I say, Ben Lynch is the master of methylation. So um, that would be a good place to go to. So you, um, you made this uncovery at this point. So the, the big discovery, there were several things that the DNA uh, told me. The big thing was that I have the MTHFR genetic mutation. Yeah. And yes. And so they do estimate that a third of the population have that mutation. And of course, 99.9% .9 of those people have no idea that they have it. Well, nobody and, screens for this as a part of a routine physical, so you right. have no idea. You just know right. that, well, my, some of my lab ranges are out of whack here. What could that be? Let's, right. Let's, yeah. 
So I found out I was MTHFR, and, and as I started studying that, I realized that, that a mutation on that gene has the ability to cause an ungodly number of diseases and symptoms and issues, one of which is bipolar and depression and anxiety and, and all sorts of other things. So I found out that I had the MTHFR mutation. I also found out that I have a ge genetic intolerance to gluten. Now I'm not celiac, so it doesn't present in me, it doesn't present, it doesn't show up as, as having the symptoms of celiac, but I do have a genetic uh, intolerance to gluten. So of course that gluten had been damaging me and I didn't even know it. So those are uh, two huge discoveries. So and those were two those huge are not things. little little details. Those are right. massive. Um, I also discovered I my dopamine and serotonin receptors were broken in about forty different places on my DNA. And and if you understand what dopamine and serotonin do, they're responsible for mood balance. Yep. And I also discovered that I have a very reduced ability to detoxify. So my liver does not do, is not capable of doing what the majority of people's livers can do. So, and the reason I mention that is because I get, I get quite upset now when I see people talking about, you know, detoxes and uh, people are like, yeah, detoxes are just a hoax and they're just, you know, expensive liver flushes that you don't need because you have a liver. And I'm like, actually, there's potentially a third of the population that can't do that. Mm -hmm. And detoxes for us are absolutely critical. Yep. Um, so there's that. But also what, what that means is not having the ability to detox means that it's super, super important that I live in, in an environment that is as non-toxic as possible. So it's super important for me that I use non-toxic, organic um, cleaning products, personal care products, paints I use in my house, you know, the, the, the carpet, the, all of those things, chemicals, furniture buy with like the furniture I buy. Gardens and things like that. So I can, I can help my, the fact that my body can't detoxify. I can help that by not surrounding it by as many toxins in the first place. Yeah. But I, the, these were things that I didn't know were a problem until I got my DNA done. So the DNA for me was like, it was hitting the mother load of data of being my own detective. Yeah, just anecdotally, we had Dr. Nasha Winters on the show just a couple of weeks ago, and she's obviously working with people who are going through cancer treatment. And one of the most critical tests that she runs on all of her patients is the genetic data. Specifically, she's looking at nutrigenetics. So how the genetic uh, profile relates back to food we eat. And, and she's looking at this because she's putting people on a very uh, specific ketogenic diet and she needs to know how that person is going to respond. And she's going down to the level of genetic data there. So a core part of what she does, she uses a nutrition genome and uh, we're going to have them on the show soon. But uh, that, that sounds like it was the first major discovery that you made, a, a self-discovery. And, and again, this is part of the core theme of this show and, and becoming your own detective. So those, those are obviously huge pieces of the puzzle that you've now started to assemble. I want to keep moving forward here because there's a lot of stuff to cover. But this obviously made some improvements as you started addressing these issues. So I'd love to hear about that. And so then if I recall correctly, you were contacted by someone who said keto could help you. Right. So at the same time, so, yeah. So it was, and it was like the universe was, was like cheering me on. The moment I fired everybody, all of these like things that I needed magically popped into my life. Yes. Yeah. And the DNA was one of them. Yeah. And it was almost exactly, it was the same months that I got mad and fired everybody and ordered my DNA that um, Dr. Ted Naiman started following me on Twitter and I'm like, okay, why is a doctor following me? Mm -hmm. You know, I was already in the low carb world. I was producing cookbooks for low carb. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was kind of a little bit known, but I was basically a nobody. So when Ted Namath started mm -hmm. following me, I'm like, okay, what's that about? Yeah. Anyways, he's he's so creeping you online. 
<laughs> so we struck up a conversation yeah. and and I said, you know, do you know anything about DNA? I've got this genome and I have no idea what to do with it. And we got talking and and he asked, you know, why the DNA? And I told him about bipolar. And he said, you know, I think I can help you. And so, of course, I had fired everybody at that point. So I had no team. I had no medical team. Yes. And he lived, I was in Seattle at the time, and he lived, his practice was like 11 miles from my house. So this felt we, like the universe. Serendipity right here. Right, exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. So I went to see him and he said the, the, I was still taking, at that point, I was still taking Lamotrigine for my bipolar 2, which was actually keeping me happy for a while. And then, and then I'd get suicidal. They'd have to double the dose, and then I was fine. Then they had to double the dose and double the dose and double the dose. So, but I was still on Lamotrigine at that point, which was literally just keeping me alive. And he said the, the ketogenic diet was developed for children with seizures. They had amazing results reducing seizures or completely getting rid of seizures in children. Since Lamotrigine is actually an anti-seizure medication, and that was giving me some relief, he th it made sense to him that putting me on a ketogenic diet might also help me. Same mechanisms. I guess that's where his head was going. If there's, right. there's benefit from this medication... Right. Uh, then he, he correlated that with, okay, maybe keto could be a safer, more sustainable uh, therapy. Right. So he put me on the ketogenic diet. I got my DNA and then I had, and I was exploring everything at this point. I had blood tests. I actually had to go and get blood draws for three days in a row because that's how much blood we needed. I ordered all of these crazy food sensitivity tests and chemical tests and like all the variables. I was like, okay, I'm just going to get everything tested. Yep. So um, I had all those done. And then three, no, two and a half, 12 weeks after, no, not even six weeks, six weeks after I first uh, went to see Ted and he put me on the ketogenic diet, I took all of this data that I'd got from blood tests and DNA to a naturopath in Seattle and we looked at everything and she came up with a protocol for me. Awesome. I, which included the methylated B vitamins, which is something that, that people with MTHFR have no ability to methylate B vitamins ourselves. So we have to take them in a methylated form. So she put me on the methylated B vitamins, but I was also, I had food sensitivities to most every food on earth. When we took, when we took all of the things I was sensitive to out of my diet, and then we applied the keto lens over the top of what was left, I was left with nine things. Bacon, so for, but, but yeah, pork was one of them. <laughs> yeah. um, so for three months, I ate nine things. Um, luckily one of them was lamb and one of them was duck. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, Hey, I can do this. Could be worse. Um, yeah. it could, could, be could, worse. Be could be hospital food. So, um, I ate nine things in rotation. Cause when you, when you have leaky gut and food yeah. sensitivities, you have to do everything in rotation. Yeah. Otherwise you just become more sensitive to more things. So I, I ate those nine things in rotation for three months. It was, and it, and it was, Ted normally when you Ted would never advise anybody to measure their their ketones as I call them on ketone strips because if you're just trying to lose weight for keto having more ketones doesn't mean you lose more weight common myth that's slowly being dispelled right so it's you know people I, I think less now but there's still people that are like chasing the purple ketones and i'm like you you don't have to do that it doesn't make anything better but for me because i was on keto for my brain we were literally trying to make my brain swim in fat so, so he, wanted, he wanted you at these higher levels right so he this was like because what pisses me off out there is these sweeping generalizations about how to do things Right. And, and you, you have to contextualize things and, and say that, yes, there are situations where you do want higher levels. This is one instance. Right. So, so I yeah. was actually, I was eating to my pea sticks. I was yeah. like, Ted's like, you get it as deep purple as you can. Awesome. But that wasn't because I was trying to lose weight. No. I did lose 10 pounds, but that, that was completely beside the point. So, so um, 
Let me jump in there. You were doing pee sticks. Did you ever use any of the blood ketone or the breath testing or was it mostly uh, urine testing? No, it, I just did the urine testing. Okay, cool. And, you know, that was three years ago before it was affordable. Yeah. You know, before the keto mojo. 99 cent and, strips right. and things of that nature. It was five so, bucks a strip in the United States, which right. is ridiculous. So it was, for me back then, it was not practical financially yeah, to, to do the other things because as i say three years ago the the keto landscape was completely different and well, so i think you bring up an important point you don't have to go spend a ton of money you you did it just with the urine strips and if people are listening those are cheap you can get them online cheap and and that worked for you and that's awesome right? and, and i only did it for i want to say three months because then i got to know I, I knew what to eat that would give me Absolutely. deep purple ketones. So you, you, you learn and then you're good. You, you, maybe you test for intellectual curiosity, like, okay, this might be time for me to revisit and make sure I, right. what I thought was working is still working. But right. You don't, once you teach yourself how to eat that way, it becomes very intuitive. Right. So I was eating nine things. I was, I was eating to get the purplest ketones possible and um and then i was doing methylated bees i had there was a bunch of other other supplements no gluten. no gluten absolutely like no gluten um and so i did that and so i'd been with ted for six weeks i added my naturopath we she added all the other protocols six weeks after that ted said you can come off the, your lamotrigine and I'm like, oh, hell no. Uh, I mean, I was terrified that's because scary stuff, um, man. when I had, I had inadvertently run out of Lamotrigine one weekend and by Monday lunchtime, I was suicidal. So I, you know, just the thought of just choosing to come off it yeah. was terrifying. Absolutely. But, so over the course of, a, so I cut it down to heart. I'm like, I can't go cold turkey, Ted. And he's yeah. like, you'll be okay. And I'm like, yeah. okay, no. So I went down to half and nothing happened. And then I halved it and halved it and halved it. And, um, and so I came off it. It was no more than a week or two. And I have been completely unmedicated and I've had no symptoms of bipolar for two and a half years since, since that day I came off it. That is absolutely incredible, Carrie. Many parallels to my own story where a lot of the extreme stress and anxiety I was going through were, were methylation issues. That was one of the first things that was discovered. And starting to fix that was the first critical steps on my own journey. So absolutely awesome work doing that and, and becoming your own detective. And I think this is helpful for a lot of people, but maybe you can tell us where you're at now. Have you been able to introduce more foods? Do you still maintain strict keto? Where, where are you at now in terms of, of, of maintenance, I guess, let's say? So b before I go there, there's a couple of things that I want to be really clear to people yeah, about. Yeah. Is that not everybody with bipolar is going to have the same treatment program that's going to work for them as i did if 100%. you have bipolar and you just start taking methylated bees you <laughs> might not end up with the same result they're, 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 it's so epigenetics is incredibly complex yes and if you are mthfr you're almost certainly going to get some benefit from from taking methylated b vitamins but one you should not do it without help of someone who knows what they're doing because and people always ask me what do you what methyl bees do you take and what dosage and i'm like i'm not going to tell you because it's not relevant to you Absolutely. you it, it's in, the, the whole methylation thing is incredibly personal and you need to find out what your sweet spot dosage is it won't help you to know what mine is and it's really really important because if you over methylate or under methylate you're going to get symptoms that might make you wish you just had the bipolar back. So it, it's really, really important that people do not try to do this on their own. And it's also really important that people understand that just taking methyl Bs is, n n there's no guarantee that that's all you need to fix your bipolar. There may be other things. It's not, it's not just a, if you're bipolar, take methyl bees and it'll all go away. 
I think that's good to reiterate. And I think that what I want to say here, if you are, if you are working with uncooperative doctors, I think your message is you can go do this testing yourself. You can yep. uncover it, but then you need a good functional doctor or a good naturopathic doctor. Yes. So we're not here to talk about take this dose or don't take that. Nope. We're here to tell you how to become your own detective and then take that information to someone who can help you properly apply what you've uncovered. Yes, exactly. Um, it, it's, yeah, I want to be really, really clear about that, that I am in no way saying that if you have the MTHFR mutation, you take methyl Bs and everything will be cured because it doesn't work like that. But it's a brilliant starting point to fine tune what will work for you. And there is hope. Well, I just watched the documentary Brain on Fire. And, and that was a woman who had uh, out of developed a, a severe mental illness that ended up being a rare autoimmune disease that attacks the brain. And uh, we had a guest on the show, uh, Kevin, and in his case, he had head trauma, but he had to fix his gut, actually. So I think what we're saying here is the puzzle is different for everybody, but you can take actions yourselves. We now as consumers have access to tests that our conventional GP has never even heard of before. Right. And we can start to make uncoveries and then you can work with functional and other types of practitioners to then help you put the protocol together. And I think that's really when the magic starts to happen. That's how the magic happened for me. And once I realized like how important the data was, that's why I built Heads Up Health. Cause I'm like, hey, I work, it worked for me, but the person beside me is going to need a completely different way to assemble the puzzle pieces. And so that's why I just think the data is so important. That's why yeah. I put heads up together. The, the, other, the other thing is that I think people don't understand, probably because much of the medical profession don't understand, is that it changes over time. So to go back to your question, where am I now? I do not have to take the same dose of methyl Bs now as I took two and a half years ago. And so this is a, and this goes for life, that it, things change. And as your body heals, you, you do, you evolve. Your dose the requirements for, for methyl Bs or this or that or something else change you know, events that happen in your life, more stress, less stress, more sleep, less sleep, changes your needs. So you, you, this isn't a, if you're this, take this, take it forever and it's all good. You That's need really to important. constantly, you need to constantly, and I called it in my talk, seek the tweak. <laughs> I love that. You yes. need to seek the tweak, but it, well, it's an ongoing thing. Seek the tweak, become your own detective. I mean, it never stops. I mean, I got heal healthy and then I got busy and, and stopped taking the methyls for a while. And I'm like, oh man, I, 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 I have to kind of start all over again and I rerun the labs. And in this day and age, this has to be driven by you as the individual. And it's, it's a constant process to manage this. Probably the most important thing we can manage in our life. And giving people information and tools hopefully can can empower more people but i think that's a really important message is seek the tweak i love it so so where i am now i i don't take nearly as many methyl bees as i used to take um because my my overall if you do a blood test on me now my levels of b vitamins are are way up where they should be whereas hold, when I hold on carrie so what lab tests are you looking at to calibrate your b12s so this, this was just a regular blood test where it had been specifically asked to measure all the levels of the B vitamins. I can't remember what the test, Al, Alcat? Okay. Yeah. I think it was me, called Alcat um, yeah. test and they did everything. They measured everything that was in your blood and everything that wasn't in your blood and should have been and they measured all the things. Um, and, and so, but if you look at my blood now versus then my, my B levels are up where they should be. So I no longer have to take the high dose of methyl Bs that I yep. did when I started. Yeah. Um, for me, it's homocysteine. Like that's one test. Again, an, another one of those tests that's not included on a routine physical. I asked my doctor to order it and he did. And then I got a $350 bill from blue cross 
just for that stupid test. Bless but, them. Yeah, but I could have ordered it online for $59 myself. But that homocysteine number was out of range high. And that was the first clue for my functional doc. Okay, we have to bring this number down. Right. The genetic data. So there's a couple others out there. There's methylmalonic acid, which I know is, is a good indicator. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. But homocysteine, methylmalonic acid, and then a lot of just the, the conventional tests can actually reveal B12 deficiencies if you have a talented practitioner that knows how to look at the numbers. Super, super important to find a naturopath who, who knows about this stuff and or a functional doctor. Super, super important. Yep. Um, and work with someone. So where I am now is I now, I am no longer, we've resolved almost all of my food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I can eat mostly whatever I like, obviously within the ketogenic range. Yep. I no longer have to do like mega keto, like therapeutic keto. Yep. I, and I actually have found that over time, I, as much as I would love to do carnivore keto, because I love meat and how easy is that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, duck breasts for every meal. Yes, yep, sign yep, me yep. up for that, yep. right? And it's super easy, you know, yep. meat, pan, five minutes, dinner's done. Yep. I'd love to do that, but I simply do not feel as well when I eat carnivore. I feel much, much better when there's an abundance of leafy greens and other low carb green vegetables in yeah. there. So and I that's actually also part of the personalization, you know, right. and, and there's people out there like Dr. Georgia Eads. She, she can't tolerate those leafy green. Vegetables. Right. And right. And Stephen, I actually, I actually did Stephen Gundry's protocol where he talks about lectins yeah. And there's a lot of people that are super sensitive to lectins, Absolutely. Yep. which means that you basically can't even look at a vegetable without being ill. Yep. And, and, I, and, and so I tested that because I'm still trying to find my perfect, like, how can I be optimally healthy? 100%, yeah. and, and I removed all the lectins and all the vegetables and I basically went carnivore for a while. But it, it, that's not a thing for me. Yeah. Um, so when I added back in all the leafy greens and, and cucumber and all of those things, that's when I feel best. Yeah. So that's, as I say, it, the, the three months at the start where I was like therapeutic keto, basically carnivore with, with macadamia nuts thrown in yeah. was what I needed at that time to, to start the healing process. But as you progress, you need to listen to your body and you need to keep, this is where Dave comes in. You need mm. to keep collecting that data. Don't ever stop collecting the data and monitoring the data. And, yeah. and even data like how do I feel when I eat X or when I eat Y or, or you know, when I, for me, this is going to sound crazy. Gasoline is a huge problem for me. Mm -hmm. So for me, it got down to the, how do I feel after I've pumped gas? Yeah. The smell of gasoline really, really affected me. Yeah. When we got all the, the test results back, one of the, 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 the Alcat test tested for all the things that my, were high in my blood that shouldn't be there. And gasoline derivatives were, I was like off the charts, which is yeah. probably why the smell of gasoline triggers me because my blood was already had a toxic load of gasoline derivative products in it. So it's things like that, that you would not be aware of if you weren't yourself going out and getting this data. Yeah, I love that. You know, my functional doctor was always testing, even if he wasn't. Yeah, well, hey, let's let's always look around some different corners. I'm not sure what I'm going to find, Dave. You know, I, I had just come back from Southeast Asia. Hey, let's test for Lyme. You know, all, good doctors are always uh, looking under different rocks, in, yep. in my opinion. And that's what actually taught me how to then just do that myself. So, um, and if this sounds all like tedious, like, you know, oh my God, I got to like track and do all this stuff for the rest of my life. I'd rather be depressed. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not, we're emphasizing it, but it, I, my experience has been that once I'd cleared all of this and I'd got my methylation issues sorted out and I'd got rid of all the food sensitivities and, and plus eating keto 
or that clean of a diet for so yeah. long, your body becomes super sensitive to changes. Mm -hmm. So it's not difficult. You'll suddenly eat something and go, okay, that affected me. Your body just becomes very sensitive. So it's not this like majorly difficult tracking process. It's not yeah. nearly as arduous. No, as it becomes it very intuitive. Honestly, there's this thing called the, this is a, a, there's this thing called the Bristol stool chart. You've probably heard of it. It's like, what does your poop look like in the toilet bowl? And that's actually a very good sign of how well your body is digesting food. And one, like you said, once you get sensitive, I mean, I just, I know immediately after I go to the bathroom, I'm like, okay, I'm not hundred percent healthy right now. That didn't agree with me. So these are not rocket science things that you have to sit in front of the computer for hours a day. You just, once you start learning how to measure and to learn these things, you, it becomes very intuitive about how your body works. You, you, the, the signals become very easy to pick up. So but you got to keep measuring. Yeah. Don't, don't go through this process. You know, if, if, if this resonates with you or if you know someone who's struggling particularly, cause this is my focus is mental health issues. It's not a, this is what's wrong. Fixed it. Check that box. It's a Keep, lifestyle. It, it is a lifestyle and the data is super important without the data that I got from 23 and me and from all the blood tests. And now of course, peeing on my ketones. I mean, that's data too, right? So, you know, where my ketone levels were, keep doing that. The data is, is super, super important. And it, that's, that's why what Dave is doing is so important because it makes it super easy to do the tracking. It makes the tracking yeah. a lot less painful because there's this one place that you can go to assimilate all the data. And then you can start looking at trends and, and okay, what happened then that meant that my data suddenly went off? So yeah. for example, things like, um, I, there was, we tracked something, the E. coli, one yeah. of the, the tests I had done when I went to see the naturopath, she did a poop test because that's yeah. what anyone in that world does. Yep. They look at your I've poop. I've had them done. I had a massive E. coli infection in my gut that I had yeah. no idea about. Yep. And I'd had it, she said she estimated I'd had it for about eight months. No yeah. wonder I was feeling crappy. Another um, test that's just not part of the routine, physical. Right. I, I had a Klebsiella overgrowth, which is like a gram-negative bacteria that is ultra stressful on the body. Right. Same thing came out in the poop test. So I, so I got this. So she, she, she told me that I had this, and I'm, I'm racking my brains. I'm going, where in the world did I get that? When did it start? So I started thinking back, and I suddenly remembered that eight months prior. For random little things, I had had three separate doses of antibiotics, which is something normally I do not take. I yep. take them. But Very I'd, calm. I've heard this many times. You, I'd cut the roof of my mouth yeah. and, and the doctor was like, it has an abscess, but if it does, it's in the roof of your mouth. It's near your brain. We have to, like, you have to take antibiotics because no. So I took antibiotics for that. I had an ear infection. So I had antibiotic drops for that. And there was something else that happened. It, over the space of, I don't know, six to eight weeks, I'd had three courses of antibiotics and that had basically destroyed everything in my gut and that had allowed the E. coli to come in and get a hold. And so it, that's the kind of like being your own detective. Okay, that's what it was that did that. Yes. And when you start doing that and you have the data that, that Dave is helping us all to track, you can start seeing trends and you can yeah. start seeing patterns. Like I ate that and this happened and Oh, I ate that and I got a migraine. Oh, and I did that. And then you start testing. So you stop eating it for five days and then you eat it and you get a migraine. So, okay, this is a problem. Yep. And you know, and you go on like that. We are mission aligned on this topic, Carrie, in terms of educating people on how to become their own detective. Your story is wonderful. You continue to share information in many different ways. So tell us about the work you're doing now 
in terms of education, the cookbooks, and where people can get more from Carrie? So I, uh, after I became keto, I kind of re, realigned myself um, because keto, and as we've seen over the last three years with the, the stories that, that people are sharing with the, the reversal of their type 2 diabetes and, and all the other amazing things that are happening to people from a health perspective, I've now... I joined the Keto Evangelist team. Brian Williamson and I do a podcast, but our focus, me and him, is food. Yeah. So I'm I'm the cook of the operation, mm -hmm. and I develop recipes for keto. What's and, the show called? Uh, keto Evangelist Kitchen. Cool. So we do that, but it's on. We don't talk about the science or or the doctors or the experts or all that kind of thing. We are we talk about, okay, I understand the theory and I know this is what I need to do and the science is fabulous, but how do I translate that into what I eat every day? Day-to-day -day life, making day -to -day it work. Day-to-day life. Yes. And, and so we talk about the food and that's all we talk about. And, and also, you know, a lot of people come to keto and they've never cooked in their life. Or they've never so, even counted a carbohydrate or anything like that. It's, it's, it's right. a radical shift. So we talk about um, how, how to make how to make delicious food a lot of people come to keto thinking that you know life is basically over because they're not going to be able to eat anything yummy mm -hmm. because everyone knows that health food tastes nasty right yeah. so my my job in this whole crazy mess is to make sure that people understand that they can eat that the food they eat on keto is every bit as or more delicious than the food that they used to eat when they were on a standard Could American agree diet. More. Yeah. Give me a ribeye and uh, I'll be happy. So I, we, we help them to be better cooks. We yep. help them to get started in cooking if they never have. Yep. And I develop recipes and, and therefore cookbooks um, to, to give people ideas and, and inspiration and recipes that they can use that with confidence that will work because a lot of those recipes out there don't yeah. um, and will will keep them on track but also stop them from getting bored or feeling deprived yeah cool and you speak at conferences you're at we, we i've seen you at keto con now i yeah, two years running. I Bring, was bringing the house down every time. You speak with conviction and passion and empathy and emotion, and yeah, it's amazing. We've got to make people feel. Yeah, because if people feel something, they'll do something. They'll they'll go do something about it, and yeah. um, it's incredibly humbling. The 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 twice I've spoken uh, about mental health, my journey with their mental health. The number of people that have reached out to me afterwards or come up to me afterwards and you know crying because they're like this is what i've been praying for my whole life this is what my son needs this is what my daughter like yeah. I, you know and it's just i'm i'm incredibly grateful and this may sound weird but i'm incredibly grateful that i went through what i did because I wouldn't, all. That's, that's, I wouldn't be able to help people if I hadn't I'm been through the same those boat. experiences. Yeah, I'm in the exact same situation. I mean, we're both, we're both giving back, I guess, in different ways based on personal experiences. So I, I do, and, and the reason I do the food is because I am actually a pastry chef by trade. That's, yes. that's, that's my trade, So awesome. which is weird because now I can't eat anything that pastry chefs do. But, but um, that's where I started. And so you know, I have training in food. So I focus on the, the practical application, the food part of it. I do write cookbooks. We have the kitchen podcast. Um, what else do I do? Oh, so Danny Vega, mm -hmm. who a, a lot of your people will know, and Brian Williams and I, we also- Articles, I love that name. <laughs> we also started um, a membership for people who are really serious about keto, who want to take yeah. it to the next level, which is yeah. called Keto Evangelist Unlimited, yep. which is say is a, is a membership program. Um, yeah, some so people need that, that level too. of assistance. You know, I, I had yeah. I had the time and the patience to go figure all this out, make a ton of mistakes, and 
do it that way but there's people for where where you need that level of at least for the first little while like help me put the training wheels on and get this figured out there's 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 actually i think a huge need for more of that kind of work getting people from zero to 60. but but it's it's also um the community because we we have three facebook groups that are enormous they're like we have i don't know hundreds of thousands of people half a million people and it's very hard to build a community with those kind of numbers so Mm -hmm. the the number one thing that uh uh, unlimited people tell us that they love is the 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 community we have a secret facebook group where we interact with them and it's much much smaller so they can they get individual attention and we've actually cool. built this really cool little community where they, they feel safe to to share their journeys and laugh and get help and you know share what's worked for them so well, Carrie, um that's all incredible work i will ask you to send the picture of us hugging because that's, <laughs> that's gonna go in the show notes so i'm holding you accountable to that one and i will happily send you the hugging picture yeah thank you so much carrie for everything that you do it's it's amazing to have you on the show i hope that we can continue to spread the word and reach people who are searching around and looking for answers and and your story hopefully can make a difference i know it already is making a huge difference but i'm just grateful to to be able to relay the the message and hopefully uh to to find and reach more people who who need some information to to help them get started and, and find their path as well I just hope that it, it's given people hope that yeah. you do not, I, I do not believe that, that anybody has to suffer with, with mental health issues. I there, agree with you. The, the path may not be exactly the same as mine, but I believe there is a path. And if 100%. you will just, so I hope this inspires you to take control of your own health and inspires you to be your own detective in the knowledge that, I believe there's a fix for you. Yes. And if this has given you hope that there's an answer for either you or somebody that you love or somebody that you work with that is, that is in a really bad place, then I hope that, that you can share this and let them know that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, that's wonderful, Gary. Thank you. And same, same message from me. <laughs> I, I want to give you some data to help you get started. So yeah, I, I echo that exact same message. I know that you said you've been to my hometown before we joined here. So if you're back in the Tahoe area, uh, we're doing coffee at the coffee bar in Truckee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Multiple yeah. coffees, actually. And yeah. now, of course, I just moved to Connecticut. So Truckee's like, you All know, right. okay. three days stretch. away now. Could be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carrie, let me get you back to your day. This was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a really, really wonderful conversation. I, I really appreciate the, the airtime to, to share what I've learned, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Bye.